Level 1. Anticipatory Anxiety You're lying in bed at 2 a.m. Your alarm goes off at 6. You have an important meeting tomorrow and you can't stop thinking about it. Worrying about a presentation activates your amygdala and releases cortisol, the same stress response triggered by physical danger, just at lower levels. We spend 47% of our waking hours thinking about something other than what we're doing. And when our minds wander to the future, we're usually catastrophizing. Penn State research found 91% of worries never happen. You're burning cortisol and losing sleep over events that won't occur. Anticipatory anxiety isn't always useless. Small doses improve performance. It makes you prepare, but we can't turn it off. You worry about a job interview for weeks. The actual interview, 10 minutes. We spend more time fearing the moment than living it. Level two, phobias. A single bad experience can wire a phobia into your brain permanently. Decades later, you'll still be terrified of something that happened once when you were six. The most common phobias worldwide include spiders, heights, flying, and needles. Arachnophobia alone affects 3% to 6% of people. Having a phobia strongly predicts developing other anxiety, mood, and substance use disorders. The paradox of phobias is they're highly treatable, but most people never seek help. Exposure therapy helps over 90% of people with specific phobias who complete the treatment. But you have to face the thing that terrifies you. So researchers created a workaround. Virtual reality exposure therapy lets you confront your fear without leaving the therapist's office. Studies show VR therapy is just as effective as real-world exposure. When participants rode a virtual elevator up a building, their bodies reacted as if it were real. Sweating, racing hearts, genuine anxiety. Your phobia isn't about the spider. It's about your amygdala lying to you. And with enough exposure, you can teach it the truth. Level 3. Acute fear. A car swerves into your lane. You react before you think. Your hands are already turning the wheel, heart pounding, breath gone. The fight-or-flight response happens when your body moves before your brain understands why. The amygdala fires instantly and sending a distress signal to your hypothalamus, which activates your sympathetic nervous system. Your adrenal glands pump adrenaline into your bloodstream. Heart rate spikes. Blood flow increases to active muscles and decreases to organs not needed for rapid movement. That's why fear kills your appetite but makes you feel like you could run forever. An ordinary person can typically access about 65% of their absolute strength, but under acute fear conditions, research suggests you might access up to 80 to 85%. Ever notice how time seems to slow down during a near miss? It doesn't. Your brain just records more details per second when you're in danger. More memories packed into the same moment makes it feel longer when you replay it. Level 4. Social Anxiety Your brain treats social rejection like a physical wound. MRI studies show that social exclusion activates the same neural regions as physical pain. Social anxiety disorder affects 12% of people at some point in their lives. It usually starts in adolescence, right when your brain is rewiring itself and you care most about what everyone thinks. Social anxiety makes you hyper-aware of your own anxiety. You notice your shaking hands, so you think everyone else notices. Then you get anxious about being anxious. Your prefrontal cortex, normally good at rational thinking, gets overwhelmed monitoring yourself while trying to perform. People with social anxiety are actually better at reading facial expressions than average. But they interpret neutral faces as negative. Someone looks blank and your brain reads it as disgust or disappointment. The spotlight effect. We overestimate how much others notice about us. When researchers had participants wear embarrassing t-shirts, the participants thought 50% of people noticed. Reality? Less than 25%. You're not the main character of everyone else's story. You're barely a background extra. Social anxiety doesn't just make you quiet. It makes you exhausted. Monitoring yourself, 
rehearsing conversations, analyzing every interaction, your brain burns energy like you've been running when you've just been standing there. Level 5. Obsessive Fear Did you lock the door? You check. You know you locked it. But what if you didn't? You check again. And again. That's obsessive fear. Obsessive compulsive disorder affects about 2-3% to of people. It's not about being neat or organized. It's about intrusive thoughts that won't stop and compulsions you can't resist. Your brain gets stuck in a loop. What if I left the stove on and the house burns down? The thought feels urgent, so you check. The relief lasts seconds, then the doubt creeps back. Compulsions reinforce the obsession. Every time you check the lock, you're telling your brain the fear was valid, so it comes back stronger. Some people with OCD experience intrusive thoughts so disturbing they're terrified to tell anyone. Thoughts about violence, about harming loved ones, about things that go against everything they believe. They're not urges. They're nightmares your brain won't let go of. The obsessions can latch onto anything. Germs, symmetry, morality, relationships. People with OCD know their thoughts are irrational, but that doesn't help. You can't logic your way out. Your amygdala doesn't care that the fear makes no sense. Level 6. Panic attacks. Your heart is exploding. You can't breathe. Your vision narrows. You're convinced you're dying. You're not. That's a panic attack. A panic attack peaks in about 10 minutes. Your amygdala floods your system with adrenaline like you're being chased by a predator. Unlike regular fear, which involves a target, a dog, a height, a situation, panic attacks don't. Your threat response fires at maximum intensity with nothing to fight or run from. That's what makes it so disorienting. Your body can't tell the difference between a real threat and a false alarm. Chest pain, dizziness, tingling hands, classic heart attack symptoms. That's why 25% of people having their first panic attack end up in the emergency room thinking it's cardiac arrest. Panic disorder affects about 5% of people. Once you've had one panic attack, you start fearing the next one. That fear can trigger another attack. It's a loop. Here's the paradox. The more you try to control a panic attack, the worse it gets. Fighting the sensation amplifies it. Trying to force yourself calm sends the signal that there's something to be calm about, which confirms the threat. Panic attacks can happen out of nowhere. No trigger, no warning. You could be asleep, and your brain just decides it's time to panic. Nocturnal panic attacks wake you up in full fight-or-flight mode for no reason. The attack ends? Your body physically cannot maintain that level of adrenaline, but knowing that, doesn't stop the next one from feeling like the end of the world. Level 7. Traumatic Fear Trauma rewires your brain. A single event can change how your threat system operates permanently. Up to 90% of people experience at least one traumatic event in their lifetime. A car crash, an assault, a natural disaster. Your brain floods with stress hormones. Your amygdala has recorded everything sights, sounds, smells, as dangerous. Most people recover, the fear fades, but about 6% develop post-traumatic stress disorder. The difference? Their alarm never turns off. A soldier hears a car backfire and hits the ground. A crash survivor freezes at the sound of screeching tires. The threat is gone, but the amygdala doesn't know that. It's still reacting to the original danger. Your hippocampus, the part of your brain that time stamps memories, malfunctions during severe trauma. The memory doesn't get filed away as past. It stays in the present tense. That's why PTSD flashbacks feel like they're happening now, not like you're remembering something that happened before. People with PTSD have a smaller hippocampus and an overactive amygdala. The brain physically changes. MRI scans show the difference. Trauma isn't just about what happened, it's about whether you had control. A car accident where you were the passenger is more likely to cause PTSD than one where you were driving. Helplessness is the variable that breaks you. Sleep doesn't help. Nightmares replay the trauma on loop. REM sleep, normally when your brain processes emotions, 
becomes another battlefield. Some people with PTSD avoid sleep entirely. The cruel part? Your brain is trying to protect you. It's scanning for danger constantly because it failed to protect you once.